What do you think the meaning of life is? To live and to live in a mystery and to find purpose and to live in the now magic <sighs> now Church, welcome to week three of a series we've been in called What Ev. My name's Clayton Walker. I'm one of the pastors here. Pumped to be here with you guys tonight. Here's what we've been saying so far, that we want to know God's will for the decisions that we have to make, like the life decisions. Like a lot of us have been there with, when, when we were choosing the college we were going to go to, the major that we were going to choose. Uh, as you graduate, you're going to be uh, praying about and wanting to know God's will about the job that you're going to get, the person that you're going to marry. And so in this series, we've been giving you some tools and some things to think about so that you can know God's will for your life. So if you hadn't been here, you definitely want to get caught up on this series. Go to RaiderChurch.com, check out the first couple of weeks, because these weeks all go together. And so we're going to be finishing it up tonight. We'll be concluding it. So make sure you kind of have all of this, because it's kind of like one package together to help you know God's will for your life. So one of the things, though, that you're going to be faced with, and I'm sure many of you are excited about this, if you haven't already gotten here yet, is that you probably, most likely, will get married, okay? And I say most likely, okay? Most likely, some of you, you know, maybe a few of you will get married, okay? No, hopefully all of you, okay, will, will get married that, that want to get married one day, okay? So one of the things you're going to have to pray about, though, is who is that person going to be? So my wife and I, this summer, will have been married for 13 years, okay? Awesome we have an incredible marriage. And so about 14 years ago, I was deciding to propose to my wife. So I go and talk to her parents and I, I'm, I'm nervous. Like I, I'm, I'm knocking on their door and I, I am so nervous. And her mom like knows, I, I guess somehow intuitively knows why I'm there. And so she answers the door and she's like, hi, Clayton. And I'm like, how do you know what I'm about to have? So, so I have a conversation with them. It goes well. You know, they, they say it's okay. So I'm like, okay, that's, that's step one. Okay. So I get the ring and I'm going to propose to Darby. So we're going out on this date and uh, we had dated for 11 months. And so we're going out on this date and like, I am, I, I am so freaking nervous. Okay. Like, like I'm driving my truck and, and we go to eat and then, and then she doesn't know what we're going to do next. And so she's like, what are we going to do next? I'm like, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you'll, you'll see, you know, you'll see. And so I'm driving and we, we get to this uh, tower, the Metro Tower, downtown Lubbock, okay? It's the tallest building in Lubbock, so it's not that tall, okay? Uh, so, but we go up to the top of this tower. I'd gotten this room at the very top uh, just for us. And so we're up there looking around. It's night and we're kind of looking over the city and stuff like that. And, you know, and I'm still just kind of, you know, like walking around, you know, like shaking. And I'm so, I, I'm so nervous. Like I know, like this is the moment, like this is the moment I'm about to propose to hopefully my wife, right? I mean, so I, I'm, I am freaking out, okay? So we're up there, we're talking, and I'm like, oh, I, I, you know, I know a good idea. Let's, let's pray, you know? So, so I ask her if she can, you know, pray with me. And so I'm praying about, like, our future together and, you know, praying in my mind, God, please let her say yes. Like, let us have a future together, right? And so, so we're praying, and while we're praying, like, I'm just trying to get the ring out of my pocket, okay? And I've got it in my pocket, and I'm like, I'm trying to pray, but I can't get the ring out of my pocket. And so when I finally get it out, like it goes fumbling out of my pocket. And I'm like fumbling, literally fumbling this ring. I'm so nervous. It goes to the ground. Fortunately, she's got, she's a Christian. She has her eyes closed. Okay. <laughs> Everyone knows you pray with your eyes closed. So I'm able to pick up this ring and open it and say, amen. And then say, you know, Hey, I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And I proposed to her and she said, yes. Okay. Now I kind of tricked her because we had just prayed together about our future. All right. So guys, listen, okay. If you want her to say yes, you get this powerful moment where you're praying together about your future. You know, you say, amen. And then you say, Hey, this is the moment. Hey, God told us, you know, we're supposed to get married, right? So, so you got to say yes. Okay. You got to say yes. So I kind of tricked her into it, but no, we've been married for 13 years and it's been awesome. So these are some of the decisions though, that I know if you haven't dealt with yet, you're going to, you're praying about who, who's that person for me? Who's that person that I'm going to marry? What, what job am I going to get? 
What am I going to do for the rest of my life? You're faced with these decisions, and they can weigh a lot on you. They can put a lot of stress and anxiety on you, and you want to know God's will. What is God's will for my life? And so what we've been doing in this series is kind of backing up off those life decisions, though. We're kind of, we're kind of raising up above the, the life decisions that we have to make, and we're looking at God's revealed will for us in the Scripture, and we're calling it the majors. What are the majors? What are the things that we've been created and designed to do? And if we know those, then maybe those will help us know the minors, like the life decisions that I have to make that aren't revealed specifically, clearly sometimes in the scripture. We've got the majors though in the scripture, like what we've been created and designed to do, like what's God's will for us? Why did he create us? What has he created us to do and to be? And how to live. And so we've been talking about that through this series. So again, catch up. Go to RadioChurch.com and and get caught up. Because these messages are all dependent upon each other. It just comes together in a package. So we're going to continue tonight. We're going to look at the third major. The first major was that we are made or we are willed. God willed us to worship him. The second major was that we are created for community. We talked about that last week and and how when we talk about community, we're talking about a circle, like we're talking about being in community in a group, in a circle. And we said that circles are better than rows, and we talked about that last week. So this week, we're going to look at the third major. And to do that, we're going to go again, like we've kind of been doing each week, we're going to go to the beginning, when God created everything and when he created man and woman. And see, what's this third major? What has God created us to do? So if you've got a Bible, turn with me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And if you don't have a Bible, just go to your phone, open up Version. Uh, we've got a, a live event there. It's Raider Church. Uh, you can also just go to RaiderChurch.com on your phone and select you know, the message notes, and you can follow along with this with the verses as well. So let's go. Genesis 2, verse 19. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. So here's what's happening here in Genesis chapter 2. God makes man, and then the first thing that God does with man is he gives him a job. He gives him a task. Like, he gives him something to work on and something to do. He gives him a a purpose. And he brings these animals to him, and and, and Adam begins to call them by name and and name these animals. God gave uh, Adam a task. He gave him a job. You see, God created us to serve him, to do something. And that's great news because it means that we can have purpose and meaning. We don't have to exist and live and just kind of wonder aimlessly. We can have purpose and meaning in this life. And we can serve something that's so much bigger than ourselves. We can be a part of something that's so much bigger than just me. God gave Adam a task. So here's the third major I want you to see tonight. Is that we've been made for a mission. Every single one of us. God made you for a mission. Just like Adam. God gave Adam a task, he created him, he gave him a task, he gave him a job, he gave him something to do. The same thing is true for you and I, and I want to show you in the Old Testament and the New Testament that you and I have been made for a mission too, and I want us to see what that mission is tonight. So, first of all, in the Old Testament, we have Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God gives Abraham this mission, and he tells him, hey, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to make you famous, I'm going to give you uh, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the, and the sand on the shore. And so he tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but then he says, I'm going to bless you, and then through you, like through your descendants, all the nations, or literally the, the word means all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So God blesses Abraham, he tells him in Genesis 12, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to give you all these descendants, which would become the nation of Israel, which would lead eventually to Jesus. He tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but through you, through the blessing on your life, you are going to be a blessing to other people. You see, that's how it works. God blesses us with something in order to be a blessing to other people. The blessing is not supposed to end with you or with me. 
And so God tells Abraham, hey, man, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you, you famous. And, and through you, all the families on earth are going to be blessed. So I'm blessing you in order to be a blessing. So the task that God gave to Abraham, he told him, hey, leave your country, go. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you famous. And through you, here's your task. All the families on earth are going to be blessed. And so God would repeat that to Israel as the descendants of Abraham multiplied and became this nation. God's desire for them was to be a blessing to the nations, just like he told Abraham. To use them to be a blessing to the nations, to be a light to the nations. And we see that all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of times when, when Israel would get off track and they would quit following the Lord, one of the reasons was because God would tell them, hey, man, I've, I've, guys, I've blessed you with, with the law, with the tabernacle, with the temple. I, I, I've made you guys famous, but you've kept it to yourself. I've blessed you, but you haven't been a blessing to the nations. See, God gave Abraham, he gave the nation of Israel a task, a job. He wasn't just blessing them and giving them all these things. He wasn't blessing them with, the, with his presence and with his truth just so that it would end with them. No, their task was to be a blessing to the nations, to use those things that God had given them and bless them with, to bless others. So we got the Old Testament, then we come to the New Testament. And I want you to see this verse, these verses in Acts chapter 20. Check this out. This is about Paul. Paul's saying this. In Acts 20, verse 22 through 24, he says this, And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned. Finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So Paul has a similar task to tell others about this good news about Jesus that he had been blessed with, that he had heard. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, I heard the gospel and it changed my life. It radically changed my life, but it wasn't supposed to end with me. He's, he, he's saying over and over and over again, God's given me a work. He's given me a task. He's given me an assignment, a job to tell other people this good news about Jesus Christ. You see, Paul is given a task, too, very similar to Abraham's, very similar to the nation of Israel. He was blessed with the gospel in order to bless other people with the gospel. And so Paul said his task that was assigned to him by the Lord Jesus was to tell others this good news. And he said, regardless of the cost, like, I've been given this task, I've been given this job, and I'm going to do it regardless of the cost. He said, God's warned me, the Holy Spirit, in other words, God has told him over and over and over again, that jail and suffering and persecution are awaiting him if he carries out the task assigned to him. And he says, listen, regardless of the cost, I'm going to carry out the task, the assignment, the mission that God has given me. It doesn't matter what it costs me. In fact, he says, my life's worth nothing to me unless I complete that task, unless I complete the job, unless I live for the mission that God has given me. My life's worth nothing to me if I don't do that. In other words, that's number one. That's priority, to live out the mission, to live out the task. And he says in Acts 20, verse 22, he says, I'm bound by the Holy Spirit. Some of the words for bound are compelled driven. He was fired up. He was excited. He was motivated. He said by the Holy Spirit to complete this task. In other words, his heart beat for it. Let me ask you, as a follower of Jesus, does your heart beat for this task that Paul said his heart beat for? this task of testifying, this task of telling others about the good news about Jesus. Because, see, here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the same task, you have the same assignment, you have the same mission 
that Paul was given. You see, Jesus gave out this mission in Matthew 28. He told his disciples, he told all of his followers, not a select few, not the ones who were called to ministry. In Matthew 28, he said, hey, listen, all of you, all of his disciples, he said, go into all the world, into all the nations, and teach them about me, tell me about me, baptize people. In Acts 1, before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, hey, listen, guys, all of you, this crowd that had gathered together, again, not a select few, not just Peter, not just Paul. It wasn't the the superheroes of the faith. It wasn't the ones that were called to ministry. No, he told all of his followers, hey, you are going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. He gave them a task. He gave them an assignment. He gave them a job. Just like God gave Adam. Just like God gave Abraham. Just like God gave Paul. Just like God's given you and me. It's not for a few of us in here. If you're saying you're a follower of Jesus, then you have a mission, you have a task, you have an assignment. And it's the assignment that Paul said, my life is worth nothing to me unless I I finish that assignment. Is that your heart? Is that your attitude? Does your heart beat for the assignment that the Lord Jesus has given you, the task of telling others about the good news about Jesus? Does your heart beat for that? Like Paul's, Paul said, I'm bound, I'm driven, I'm motivated. I'm compelled to live out this mission that I was made for, that I was created to do. You were made for a mission, the Jesus mission. And so you might be thinking, well, how can I tell? Like, how do I know if I'm living out this Jesus mission? What does that look like? Well, here's a few ways. Number one, you're, you're telling others about Jesus. And that can be a real simple thing. You can just tell people about what Jesus has done for you. You can tell people about what God's doing in your life. You don't have to know everything and, and know all the verses. In fact, there was a woman in the Bible that Jesus was talking with, she was speaking with, and Jesus leads her to believe in him as the son of God. And it says she goes away and she goes back to her hometown and it says she tells everyone about what Jesus had done for her. And it says in the gospels that there were many people in her town that believed in Jesus. There were many that were added to their number because of her testimony because of her story. You have a story about what Jesus has done in your life, how he rescued you from your sin. You have a story. You should have a story on a daily, on a weekly basis about what Jesus is doing in your life and how he's changing your life. Tell your story. Tell people about what Jesus has done for you. Your story is more powerful than anything, any argument, any apologetic. Your story is more powerful than all of those things. Because nobody can argue, I was once what was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Nobody can argue with your story. So you can tell other people about Jesus just simply by telling them your story. How you met Jesus and what Jesus has done for your life. How your life's been changed through following Jesus. You're on mission if you're telling other people about Jesus. Secondly, you're on mission. You're living for the Jesus mission if you're giving to Jesus' mission. Like financially, you're investing in the, the spread of the gospel. It's our mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we're about that here at Raider Church. We want to see every student at this campus come to know Jesus. And follow Jesus with all their heart. And then as they become on fire for Jesus and they begin to follow him, maybe some of them will end up going to the nations to tell people about Jesus who've never heard about him before. But to do that, to have Raider Church, to send people to the nations, and we've got a lot of you that are involved in our goer process right now, getting trained in phase one or phase two to go to the nations. To make all those things happen, we need to be giving to the Jesus mission. We need to be investing financially. Jesus said, for your treasure is there, your heart will be also. If we treasure the spread of the gospel, then that's where our heart will be. That's where we'll give. That's where we'll invest. There's no better investment of our money than the spread of the gospel at Texas Tech and around the world. 
I really believe that. So you know you're on mission. You're living out the Jesus mission if you're giving to Jesus' mission. Third, you're inviting people to church. You're, you're living out the Jesus mission when you invite someone to come with you to Raider Church. When you invite people to come and to experience the, the power and the presence of God, when, when followers of Jesus come together and they worship God and they study the Bible together, there's power in that. My brother's life was changed because people started inviting him to come to church. Many of your lives here tonight, your life has been changed because someone invited you to come here. I've talked with people, some of you out in the lobby after Raider Church, and people will tell me, some of you have told me you committed your life to Christ, and that's awesome. You know, hey, how did, how did you get here? You know, what, what led you to come and to make that decision? And I remember probably a few weeks ago, a girl turned around and she pointed at her roommate. And said, she invited me to come. She kept inviting me to come over and over and over again. I finally came and she gave her life to Christ. Some of you are here tonight and you're following Jesus because somebody invited you to come. That's living out the Jesus mission. When you invite someone to come to church with you. And then finally, you know you're living out the Jesus mission when you begin to suffer for Jesus. And that's difficult here in America. Because a lot of times we don't experience the, the persecution that people are experiencing all around the world. Where people are literally dying for their faith in Jesus and dying because they're spreading the word. They're spreading the good news about Jesus. But there are ways that we suffer here in America for living out the Jesus mission. One could be financially. Because we're giving to the Jesus mission, we don't do all the same things that other people do that maybe make the same amount of money that we do. Because we got a different priorities. We're giving to something else. We're living, we're giving to something bigger than ourselves. And so I don't have all the same things that other people do. Maybe it's that I lose some friends. Maybe it's some family members turn their back on me. Maybe I, I don't do the exact same things that I used to do on the weekends that I, that I did before. So even though we don't suffer in the same way, there could be some suffering that you would experience, some loss that you would experience because you're trying to live out the Jesus mission. This weekend, I had a friend who told me that his friend started talking bad about me and Raider Church and things like this. This is one of my best friends. And so this guy told my friend, one of my best friends, he said, yeah, there's a special place in hell for Clayton. He said, there's no way that this many people would be coming if we were really teaching the truth here. And so he said, there's a special place in hell for me. Because there's no reason that churches should be this big or anything like that, that this many people should come. And so I told my friend, I was like, well, then he's going to hate heaven. Because Revelation says there's a multitude that nobody can count that are going to be worshiping Jesus and standing before the Lamb. So he's really going to hate heaven. You might want to warn him. <sighs> you may experience some persecution when you try to live out the Jesus mission. You're trying to lead other people to follow Jesus. But Paul said, listen, it's worth it. Regardless of the cost, it's worth it. My life is worth nothing to me unless I'm living out the mission for which Jesus called me to. You were made for a mission. And listen, when you're not living the Jesus mission, as a Christian, you're going to get bored. I'm just telling you right now, and for the rest of your adult life, if you ever get bored with Christianity, it's probably because you're not living out the Jesus mission. I'm having more fun than I've ever had in my entire life. I'm not joking. I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. I have more joy and peace and fulfillment than I've ever had in my entire life. My life is better than it ever was before since I've been following Jesus and trying to live out the Jesus mission. So I know some of you are probably hearing like, okay, that's great, but what does that have to do with who I'm going to marry, okay? 
or the job that I'm going to get. Like, I mean, that's, that's all great and good, but what does that have to do with the life decisions that I have to make, okay? The major, that's, that, that's, a, that's a great major, okay, but what does that have to do with my minors, okay? I need some help with my minors, right? So here's the big idea for tonight. Live on mission and then choose whatever. You got a decision in your life? First of all, live on mission and then choose whatever. And here's what I mean by that. You've got a decision to make. You need to make that decision through the lens of the mission that you were made for. You need to choose that job or that person that you're going to marry or that, that house that you're going to buy or that car that you're going to, or, or whatever decision that you've got to make. You want to make it through the lens, like we've talked about each week, of the mission that you were created for of the mission that Jesus has given you as, a fo- as one of his followers. He's given you the mission, just like Paul's mission, to tell others about the good news of Jesus. You need to make that decision through that lens. Bill Bright, the leader, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, said this, we must allow Christ to so control our lives and our minds, every area of our lives, that we will do those things which ultimately result in the largest number of people receiving Christ. You got a decision to make? How about you make it through this lens? Is that going to result in the most number of people giving their life to Jesus? Because that's what's most important. Paul said it was worth his life. So I would challenge you to make the decisions that you have to make, that you're praying to God for, that you're asking for God's. Make it through the lens of the mission that you were made for, because the mission comes first. Bill Bright went on to ask these questions to help us think about this. He said, is my time being invested in such a way as to introduce the greatest number of people to Christ? Check this out. Are my talents or spiritual gifts being invested to introduce the greatest number of people to Christ? And then finally, is my money, my treasure being invested to introduce the greatest number of people to Christ? You see, here's what happens when you live on mission and then you choose whatever. That person that you're going to marry, all of a sudden, the standard gets a little bit higher because you're not looking for someone that's just lukewarm anymore or just as a church attender. No, you're looking for someone who follows Jesus and lives out the Jesus mission. Now that becomes part of your standard for who you're looking for. You've got a house to buy. Well, if I'm living on mission, I'm giving to the Jesus mission first. I'm giving to the spread of the gospel first. So now, what kind of house can I afford to buy? What kind of car can I afford to buy? Because the Jesus mission comes first. See, I'm making my decisions through the lens of the mission that I've been made for. Because I don't want to waste my life, and I don't think you do either, on things that don't matter in eternity. Make the decisions that you have to make through the lens of the mission that you've been created for. And when you do that, like we've said each week, when you're living on mission, then you'll make decisions that honor and please God and that result ultimately in your happiness and joy. But only then, if you make decisions without thinking about the mission that you've been created for, you'll probably make decisions that don't matter in eternity and that end up being a waste. So I want to challenge you, live on mission and then choose whatever. What we've been saying in this series, week one, we said, hey, worship God and then choose. Week two is choose a circle and then choose. So in other words, we've we've said, be in right relationship with God and then choose. Week two, choose a circle, be in right relationship with others, with other followers of Jesus, and then choose. Make your decision. And now week three, we're saying, live out the Jesus mission, and then choose. So to sum all of that up, here's my challenge for you in this series. Love God, then choose whatever. Love God, Jesus said, with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Love God and then choose what you want to do. And the Bible says, if you seek the Lord with all of your heart, he'll give you the desires of your heart. 
In other words, if you if you're loving Jesus with all of your heart, if you're following him with all of your heart, you're living out the Jesus mission with all of your heart, you're, you're, you're in community, and so there are people are helping you make wise decisions. In other words, to sum all of that, you're loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then choose what you want. Because God's heart has become your heart. When you love God first, his will becomes your will. And now you can freely choose whatever you want to do. Because it's not you that's making that decision. It's God that's making that decision through you. A while back, I was a youth pastor. And I loved being a youth pastor. It was my first ministry job. And I did it for about four years and and, and was having a blast, having the time of my life. And I began to have a desire to lead the college ministry at this church. This is a long time ago. And so I was praying about that. My wife, Darby, and I, we were praying about that and talking with the other staff at our church. And, and I remember one of the guys that was on this committee that was going to make this decision. And he, he was asking me, Clayton, why do you want to do this? And I was given, you know, a lot of different answers and trying to be real spiritual about it and, you know, praying about it. And, and, and he said, no, he kept asking me, no, why do you want to do this? And finally, I, got to, I just got to the point where I've said, listen, all I know, all I can tell you is I'm seeking God with all of my heart. And I, I, this is what I want to do. He said, sounds great. That's what he was looking for. The same thing is true for you. Seek God with all of your heart. And then choose what you want to do. Let's pray. I know some of you are here tonight and you've got a big decision to make. You've got something that's been weighing on you. You've got something you've been praying about, you've been asking for God's help with, you, you're wanting to know God's will for X, whatever that might be. It might be a major, it might be a person, a relationship, it might be a job, it might be something financial. You're wanting God's help, you're needing God's wisdom, direction for that decision. If that's you, and throughout this series, God's been speaking to you and You've been praying and asking for his direction throughout this series. If that's you, I just want to challenge you to lift up your hand. Okay, there's hands up all over the place. If that's you, just keep it up. If that's you, you've been praying for God's help, direction, for his wisdom, for his will, and some decision that you have to make, just keep that hand up or lift your hand up if you haven't yet. God, I pray for every person with their hand up right now. God, that you would help them to worship you with all their heart. You would give them the faith to step out and to choose a circle, to get involved in Christian community. God, you'd help them to live on mission for you. God, you would give them the desires of their heart as they love you, as they follow you, as they seek you. Speak to them tonight. Give them direction. Lead them by the Holy Spirit. And let them feel the peace and joy that comes from putting you first and having the freedom to choose. In Jesus' name.